My name is Philip Notodane. I'm the founding director of the Homeless Museum of Art. This is where I hold office at the foot entrance of the High Line, along with my director of public relations, Florence Coyote, stated, coaxed me to interview two directors of art fairs, Amanda Coulson of Volta and Cornel DeWitt of Pulse. Cornel de Witt has been at the helm of Pulse for the past five years. I was intrigued by a picture I had seen of him where he was wearing a t-shirt that said, Fuck Art Fairs. When we met, I did not ask him about it, but I was hoping to find some of that flippancy reflected in our interview. But it turned out that he was quite a slick sell. Amanda Coulson is the director of the National Art Gallery of the Bahamas and has been the artistic director of Volta, which she co-founded in 2005. She came to visit me at my museum booth in Chelsea, a few blocks away from the old meatpacking district. I wondered how the meat of the art world gets pre-selected, packaged, and then sold for top dollars. For an artist to go through an art fair is like walking a cow on a guided tour through a slaughterhouse. Yeah, of course, yeah, and I've never actually tried to, I mean, we always call it a curated art fair, and in every yeah. interview I've ever given, I've always said that's an oxymoron, it's, it's not an exhibition, it's right. a fair, it's a trade fair, people are there to make money, and I think yeah. there's all things that we shouldn't be ashamed about, and all these things of, you know, certain fairs saying, oh, like, they don't call themselves a fair, they call themselves a temporary exhibition. Right. Sorry, everyone's there right. to sell their work. So let's it's call fair. it by its name. So, yeah. It's it's an art fair. It's a slash trade show. Trade show. Yeah. It's it's where the, the cattle get slaughtered. Yes, it right. is where the cattle right. get slaughtered. Right. And but you know, uh, that's what happens when you eat meat. It's, it's a very, fair critique from an artist's perspective, I believe. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, it and, it and, is. And it's the word. If it's you continue with the analogy, you're the purveyor, and 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 the visitor or art right. collector is. Yeah. The is the consumer. Right. But there's a there's a lot of people who love hamburgers. You know, right. and, so, and that's Absolutely. what you know, and so there, there's like I said, I, I can certainly understand from the the perspective of the artist that it can be very discomforting. But I do think that um, that it's very much a guilty pleasure for people. Mm -hmm. um, there you know, there are certainly people who will give up um, a lot of things before they'll give up their art collecting. You know, people were continuing to shop at Prada, but then they'd want their stuff put in a, in a brown paper bag to take it home because they were, you know, they were, they didn't want people, they didn't want to be seen as flashing things around. Well, art is kind of, it, when it comes to your apartment or your house, it's in a brown paper wrapper and it hangs on your walls and just yourself and your friends see it. And I think that that's a really, um, there's something to be said for that. Well, I think one thing Vault has never done has been faddish, actually. We're, we're, I think we're not like the cool art fair. We all know which the cool satellite art fair is. And we, we've right. tried to avoid um, becoming part of fads. And we've also tried to, you know, show historical positions that we feel were missed and things like that. So we try to balance it out by, by not becoming too hip and too faddish, and by but maintaining our size. I mean, obviously, but isn't that the new hip, not being hip? Oh, is it? I don't know. I'm, I'm obviously too old to know what's hip anymore. It's really about uh, having a passion for art and the artists that uh, that we're all working with, and uh, and not having this uh, this attitude that you know that uh, that they're too cool for school or something like that. But this is uh, Christopher Porter. He's an artist represented by uh, Fred Torres Collaborations, which is a gallery here in New York. Is there any character here that somehow you see yourself in this, in this uh, dystopia? <laughs> I, I, I would hope not, because it is a bit dystopian. But uh, I'm a great believer in transparency. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm very honest with people that ask me questions about the fair, or if people don't get in and they ask why, I'm very explicit about it. I don't. I don't give kind of blanket, I don't send out blanket emails that are pre-written and sent to 150 people. Yes. I, and even with our rejection letters, I really like write to each gallery. We go through a process of 
Um, it works f from two directions. One, where we see pieces like Fred Wilson, where we think, okay, we need to find a place where we can install this. This is something that's really special. We're really excited to be working with Fred, and we find a piece for it. Other times we have a specific space that we feel that, that we need to fill. That's how we end up with, uh, you know, with something like the lead pencils, uh, the lead pencil studio installation. Um, so I find it very interesting to see lead pencil studio installation mm -hmm. from the get go. You have this influx of the outside in. Right. Then you hit dystopia. Mm -hmm. Then you have this affair by an African American mm -hmm. who is known for his institutional critique. Mm -hmm. I cannot. To recognize a certain streak here. I do feel like I, I invented a monster, like I made Frankenstein, and now it's one so because you know when Volta started, there weren't that many, and it has. But but when we started, we really were trying to help galleries and artists of a certain niche that we felt weren't like really being given the same amount of attention that other others were. It's about providing an opportunity for our galleries to be able to be. A, a more mature, more established gallery. But maybe they don't want to do, uh, you know, they're not in Freeze, they're not in Armory, or they're not in the Art Basel, but they have uh, reached a certain level. You know, we have a number of galleries that are ADAA members. Um, and so we do like to make sure we provide a home for those galleries as well as, uh, as young guys. For instance, right across the, the aisle here is um, uh, Laurie Shabibi Gallery from Dubai, uh, exhibiting with us for the first time. So can we foresee a Pulse Abu Dhabi in, in the <laughs> no, future? I, that, 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 I don't, that, that I don't think. I don't think so. It's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a tremendous amount of work for the staff that we have right now to do the, the two fairs a year. Um, and we really, we're not, we're not really on a, on a lateral growth model. We're more on a vertical growth model. Huge, you know, huge. It's not, there's no middle class anymore. And, and those people in the middle are not getting paid, and that's what's happening in the art world too. It's just all this crazy money at the top. Absolutely, and we have basically on both ends of the spectrum the one percent. Yeah, it's the homeless and the. And here we are, homeless. And and the, that other one percent. <laughs> and so I don't think there's anything wrong with with money. I think money's good, and you know that's how we feed our children and clothe ourselves. Um, I think the problem is that it's, it's, it, there's just, absurdity just, has happened, same as it has just in life. Just excuse me, just a quick interruption since you're yeah. speaking about money. I am actually contractually obligated from my sponsor to, to have a little moment that I, oh, I, I need to promote her, her very good work. Uh, would you care for a little snack? As long as it's not a dog um, snack. <laughs> um, well, it, it, it happens to be a dog snack. <laughs> market is smart. Right, right. The best art is what for you? The, the best art is what moves you. There's a great degree of truth in what he says, but, it, but from a purely, you know, Econ 101 perspective, you know, that's the first thing you learn in Econ 101 is a thing's value is what is exactly what people, somebody is willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. But, um, and at the end of the day, yeah, you know, everybody here is trying to make a living, but we're also really trying to, um, we're all talking about uh, artists that we're passionate about and showing artists that we're passionate about. The best art is the most expensive art. <laughs> and that the, the, the market is smart, you're laughing. Well, you have to, right? I mean, you have to yeah. laugh in the face of absurdity. The art fair was fair to the, the uh, evaded the, the, the bursting of the bubble. I mean, yeah, by a hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It did. yeah it, I mean, it was certainly. Right. Industry, oh, yeah, absolutely. It was, it was affected. The art fair but, yeah. is, is, is just it, it, and, and it bounced back as fast as the Dow did. It was thinned, and then the money that was left got all put in one place. Right. So I think right. there were a lot of galleries that closed. There are a lot of people that have, you know, had to had to move on because right. of it. Right. There was a little bit of a pinch, but still, yeah. it seems like yeah. we're so bad. No, no, it's come it. back extremely strong. And, and with course, the, almost yeah. with a vengeance of yeah. like, it, it's a party. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and you are here, and I'm here, and. Well, I think when you escape death, don't you have that euphoria moment where you go crazy? I think it's a bit like that. I think right. everybody thought, oh my God, it's going to die. And oh, we survived. Let's go crazy. I can be. What is this for you? What is this? Uh, it's, well, it's, you know, it's abstract work that I think that um, it's, you know, it's, 
it's very recognizable as his style. When you see works by him, you can say, okay, this looks like Andrew Masulo's work. But, you know, each one taken individually, there's such a, you know, there's a constant evolution. He's constantly changing. And the way, you know, you don't, no two look really quite anything like each other. And that's, that's a, a, a startlingly difficult thing to do. Right. Um, I'm always amazed how many art schools don't actually insist that the students learn the history of art. Right. Um, so it's not only to put the blame on the artist, but then I do think, I don't know if it's something about the way it's become kind of a, a star thing and people want to be, they feel to be original, they have to create something out of nothing, or that there's, or they feel they've invented the wheel when actually they haven't. They haven't, um, they haven't. No. And you, you see that repeatedly. Um, well, we were talking about Maurizio Catalan before we started this right. conversation. Yes. And uh, one of the pieces he did, that piece where he taped Mar um, his dealer to the wall, right. uh, there's a performance artist from the late 60s, early 70s in California right. did who, he, who, did, who did that. Is there an art fair look for, for the art that you see here? Is well, I mean, if there is, it's, it's by... It's, 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 it's a lot of sex to feel. I mean, it's, it vibrates. It's like you cannot not stop. Right. right? But it's the flip sexy. side of that is that you know, the, is that it, it takes a, a great amount of risk to do something like this at an art fair because, you know, somebody comes to an art fair and they're looking to buy something, they look at this, they can't imagine installing that in their home or something like that. Mm -hmm. The elder daughter, Emily, she always drew pictures yeah. and my husband had a commercial art gallery, so at a certain point um, she would draw pictures, he'd draw very pretty pictures of trees and flowers and houses and she, mommy, this is for you, and then she'd do a big scribble thing and she'd give it and said, and this is for daddy's gallery. Very nice. <laughs> Eighteen reasons to cease making art. There you go. <laughs> there is a photo he did for the last ten years in Cuba. Basically, he's it's showing that one. right that that things by can happen by accident that are better than any anything that you can come up with yourself. And what do you make out of the fact that the old masters that you dealt with mm -hmm. as an art historian mm -hmm. and as a, as a budding art dealer who decided this is not really for me, um, that the prices for contemporary art are much higher yes, much than higher. for these old yeah. masters. Does yeah. that say something about the culture? Absolutely. It's so much to do with branding and uh, branding and status and, and all those things. And I mean, old masters used to be a status symbol in a certain way, um, but I think Contemporary art has become a status symbol in a, in a in a much more kind of common way, and it's been this is a common denominator into a way that likes of everybody can understand. Right. And uh, yeah, I think it's the prices really reflect that, reflect the, the merchandising of art. We try to demerchandise it. We try to really get it back to uh, it being that interaction. We can move both of our our balls simultaneously through the maze to the finish and finish together, or we can compete against each other. <laughs> that you know exactly. Yeah, it is one of those things that happens at art fairs. Right. And then it's about this smooth operation. How do you not fall through? Right. Fair dealing. Exactly. So it's interesting how there are here and there moments of, I would say, playfulness and reflection. Absolutely. And we try as much as possible to remind people that, um, that it's not just a, a, a commodity. Well, I'm, I'm now uh, working at a museum as well as running Volta, so I have slightly turned my little tiny bit of my, I haven't turned my back to the market, I'm kind of cold shouldering it right now a little bit. And so I'm researching and writing a lot more for that. I typically sit somewhere and have a martini. Oh, you know what I do? I go look at old master paintings. I go to the Frick. I, I get out of contemporary completely and I just try to forget about it. And I, I go back to another time where I don't, it's not all about like what's new and what's emerging and the market and the people. I could just go somewhere where that doesn't matter anymore. So there you have it. Well, even 
insiders of Art Fair will admit that it is an unpleasant, cutthroat business. Art Fairs are here to stay. There is too much money to be earned and spent for the phenomenon of Art Fairs to go away. And artists will have the option of either playing Andy Wall's game of the business of art or opt out and become homeless. Are you ready? I'm here to welcome you all.